I came into possession of the Lonsford house through the accident of my uncle's death. My inheritance from him enabled me to buy it, for it was the isolated kind of dwelling I'd been looking for in order to finish a novel I was working on. I've always found it impossible to create anything worthwhile in the noise of the city. The house was fully furnished, but since it had been empty for many years, it was extremely dusty, and I spent my first day cleaning away the dust in the few rooms I intended to use. Lonsford House. I remember the place as if it were only yesterday I discovered the green vase, learnt its terrible secret, and passed so nearly through the veil that separates sanity and the madness that lies beyond midnight. Biotex, the new soap and pre-wash powder presents Beyond Midnight by Michael McKay. Lonsford House. The agent hadn't been enthusiastic. I got the impression that he didn't much care whether he sold me the place or not. There's nothing extraordinary about Lancet House, Mr. Royd. It's very big, of course. It's plenty built and big in those days. If it wasn't so strongly built, it'd have fallen to pieces years ago. A house needs to be cared for. Leave it empty. <laughs> hmm. Well, it's what I'm looking for. Nicely back from the road, surrounded by trees. A lot of trees, yes. Yeah. Fields, pastures. It's hard to find somewhere without any close neighbors these days. Oh, I can show you others. There's a place in... Um... Feltham, I want to buy Lansford. You do? I do. <laughs> well, then. Uh, nothing else I can... No. Right, sir. You uh, write books, you say? I write books, yes. When can I take possession? Today. Oh, marvelous. I'm halfway through a book at the moment, you see. I've been stuck for weeks. I need peace. No. For five days after moving in, I worked from five in the morning right through the day until it was dark. The book progressed beautifully. I was even thinking of who the film rights should go to when I hit another dull patch. Nothing. I destroyed a few thousand words and left the typewriter until a possible return of inspiration. I was fairly satisfied, though, and it was with a lot of pleasure that I began to examine more carefully the house I'd so quickly and perhaps rashly bought. In most ways, it was typical of the houses erected in the country a hundred years ago. It needed a lot of money spent on it before it would assume the splendor it deserved. But I needed only one or two rooms. One thing puzzled me. The little attic. to rearrange the kitchen the next day. I knew instinctively that no good would come of hammering the typewriter. The place was in a terrible state. I cleaned out some cupboards, did a bit of inexpert scrubbing, and then, while I was reaching up to hook a number of miscellaneous objects out of a sort of old-fashioned tall boy thing in a corner, I accidentally knocked off a shelf, a canister. It opened, 
and a piece of folded paper fell out. An old piece of paper, brown with age, badly worn and tattered. There was writing on the paper. It was barely legible. The ink had faded badly and large sections of the script had been worn or torn away. It was dated over 30 years before. And all that remained of the entire first paragraph beneath the date was Stephen Lansford, a young man of 25. And that was all the first paragraph said. Thereafter occurred a puzzling sequence of half lines, sentences, paragraphs, in this order. To have him tutored in the arts. Particularly gifted in pottery making. Stephen developed a great fondness for his tutor and under his guidance did the only constructive work of his life. A crude, ugly vase, bilious green in color. Stephen was proud of it kept it on the center of a small table in the living room. Dismissed. Stephen raged for days, and there began a subtle deterioration of a character which had always heretofore been shy and retiring. Ugly metamorphosis, a kind of madness in the course of which he would never allow his vase to be moved. Made his mother promise that it would never be moved under pain of dire punishment, but left to stand where he had put it. Some strange elemental bond seemed to have developed between the young man and his creation. After Stephen's death, Mrs. Lansford was unable to bear the thought of... Instead, she had the casket sealed, obtained permission from the authorities, and in the attic. Thereafter, rigid adherence to her promise. Stipulation in her will adjuring all future occupants not to move the vase. When a relative came to live in the house after her death, body torn, rent apart, found beside the table. I will, I know, eventually lift the vase. And that's all. I couldn't make a lot of sense out of it, I must admit. I tried to read to make out the bits that had faded, but it wasn't possible. On the end of the whole thing was a signature. Matthew Hargrove. Suddenly I remembered seeing in the living room which I hadn't had time to clean, a small table pushed over against the wall with a cloth covering an object of some bulk. <sighs> that would be it, all right. See what they meant in that letter thing. It is crude. <laughs> Ugly as sin. Matthew Hargrove. Wonder who he was. Or is. There was nothing in Uncle's papers about anyone of that name. Matthew Hargrove. Matthew Hargrove. Matthew Hargrove. You're the young chap that bought the Lunsford place? Yes, I, uh, I expect to be a regular customer here. Hmm. People don't talk much about what happened to that Hargrove man. Used to be Mrs. Lunsford's lawyer. Wrote up the old woman's will. Oh, queer that was. All about some vase thing her son made. Mm hmm? Funny things went on after she died, you see. You want anything more than the razor blades, do you? What funny things? Well, there was Reuben Yates. That was her cousin. Came down when she got sick and stayed. You're from the town, aren't you? You don't get to hear about things like we do down here in the country, you see. What happened to Reuben Yates? Reuben Yates? Ah, well. They found him next to that table with the vase on it. 
Teddy was torn apart. I see. Uh, and, and where does Matthew Hargrove come in? Oh, right after. He was the next one to move into the house. And he was the next one found by the table, too. Same as Robin Yates. People say that they that saw him got sick in their stomachs for weeks afterwards. And then? No more. Nobody else moved into that house. From then till the day you moved in, nobody. Nobody at all. The inference behind Mrs. Culkin's, the lady in the village shop's words, added to those in the fragmented letter, began to take a kind of nagging form in my thoughts. For the rest of that day, I tried to write. I couldn't. No city noises. But there was another distraction now. The vase. And the strange story behind it. The living room drew me. And I went in. I looked at the ugly thing for a long, long time. And then I stretched out my hand to lift it. Suddenly I remembered Reuben Yates and Matthew Hargrove. <laughs> Come on, Lloyd. Stop being. But even so, I only lifted the thing a quarter of an inch from the little table. It was about ten seconds later that I heard it. <laughs> air freshener. It doesn't just mask smells with heavy scent, it actually knocks them right out of the air. Airwick keeps the home sweet with a country fresh atmosphere in every room. Put Airwick on your shopping list. It comes in economical bottle or up to the minute aerosol. Get Airwick. Soak, soak, that's all you have to do. Soak, soak, just for an hour or two you find Biotech. Amazing new biotech soaks, stubborn stains away. Clean, clean, everything soon will be clean, clean, for all the world to see. Soak, soak, stains away easily when you use new biotech. 
Get amazing new biotechs today and let soaking do the washing. Why I did it, I don't know. Even then, something told me I was meddling in things I could never hope to understand. There was something in the house I knew then that could bathe me in the fires of purgatory forever in the day. But I came down the stairs and placed two more coins under the vase, tilting it further. I immediately returned to the attic door. through that keyhole from the room beyond. I did not wait long. Something was trying to get out. I removed the coins again from under the bars and it once more rested as it had done so for 30 years. All next day, the memory of that experience preyed on me. I couldn't work. I could hardly bear to be alone. The vase exercised an unholy fascination on me. I was in desperate need of company. And that's why I wrote an invitation to Edward Clayton and asked him to spend a week with me to celebrate my inheritance. He came as I knew he would. We'd been great friends for many years. But for the first three days, I was loath to confide in him. Ah, this could be splendid, Dennis. This room, lights, air. Have to do something with those curtains, of course, but... uh, And uh, what's this? For the love of heaven, don't touch that vase. Why not? What's this? Sit down. Uh, I'll tell you. Hmm? Come on, man. I mean, you must take me seriously. But granting that what you say is true, what... I mean, what the devil does it mean? I don't know. You read the letter? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. You just read it in front of you, didn't I? Edward, promise me you will not touch that vase. (laughs) But... uh, that put me in the position of uh, subscribing to your fears. Please. All right, promise. Scout's honor. <laughs> I need beer. Lots of cold, cold beer. Come on, the ghost isn't walking at the moment. He promised. Oh, yes. But he promised without believing. And perhaps the very promise he made was a challenge. Next day, he seemed unable to concentrate. Twice when I spoke to him, he didn't hear me. He was in a kind of dream, thinking of something else. I knew what it was. I did everything I could to divert his attention. I read him part of my novel, which had come to a full stop. He listened and made some favorable comments. For a while. But I knew I was not holding his attention. He kept wandering about the house, and inevitably his journeying took him by or into the room where the table and the vase upon it had lived for the past 30 years. This thing seems to fascinate you. Hmm? The vase. Vase? Oh, the vase. (laughs) You can't take your eyes off it. I've been watching you. Oh, at first, will I? It was a fairy story. And now? Well, now I'm not so sure. I wonder. Don't. Some malignance is associated with that thing. Some bond ties it to something in the attic. What do you... I mean something linked with it in, 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 in space or time. Or in the attic. Or in the attic, yes. If you think so, why haven't you been up there to see? 
locked. Well, I couldn't bring myself to break in. There's no time like the present, then, is there? You game? I, I, I didn't know. Well, make up your mind. You, you can't just live here with half truths. You either find out there's something nasty and horrible around, in which case you move out. Or you find out it's all a silly mistake. Lay the ghost and continue writing your book in peace. And incidentally, I think your book will be very splendid. Thank you. So, let's go and see what's up in the attic. Bring the lamp. All right. Got the lamp? Yes. Coat off, I think. Danger. Men at work. Yep. I take it that this is Stephen Lansford's coffin. His mother had him put here. I imagine so. Yes. The vase is the one he made uh, in the letter, if you remember. Yes, exactly. Well. Yes, I, I know what you're thinking. It doesn't hold water, Dennis, and you ought to be the first to see it. Nothing about this thing holds water, as you put it. Well, it isn't a bad place to rest. If you were dead, I mean... Dry, at least. Better than six feet under, eh? <laughs> Don't stare at it like that. Nothing's going to rise up out of it, Daddy. Isn't it? No. Gloomy slot the last visit. Let's get out of here. Okay. What are you going to do about uh, this room, attic? I'm going to seal it. Nail it up. Moaning noise you talked about. Yes. Care to demonstrate? All right. Listen. I'm, I'm all ears. Slowly, I lifted the green vase. Half an inch. Off the table. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Now you've heard. Let's have that drink, and then I think I'm ready for bed. Books come to a dead stop at the moment. Do you know what? If nothing happens with the book, I mean, by the time you leave, I'll come back to town for a while. If and when I sell my book, if it's published and makes money, maybe I'll have you in place. What are you doing? Put the vase down! I 
I moved towards him, whereupon he lifted the vase high above his head and backed away, grinning madly. Then we heard the attic door beaten down. <laughs> From Edward Clayton's face. Take the bars, Dennis! My God! My God! Oh. He dropped the bars, it smashed into a hundred pieces, and then the thing was at the door, and the door opened, and it was in the room! Dennis! Please. I wait. I leapt towards the window, and before I crashed through the glass, I half turned. Something had entered that room beyond my range of sight, for Edward was hanging limply aloft in mid-air. Here. Thanks. So, that's about it then, eh? That's it. Poor Edward. Poor. Poor Edward. <laughs> no, no, steady on. The doctor said you not to get out of bed. You've had a shock. Poor Edward. I told him. I told him. I did, Sergeant. Yes. Well, the folks from Bernstrom went up there and there he was. Just like the others. It was a thing neither you nor any other man could have done. There's one more thing, sir, I'm afraid to have to tell you. They took matters into their own hands. They burned down your house. Took your stuff out first and set fire to the house. Yes, it was just as well. I couldn't have gone back there. Funny thing, though. You said the vase was smashed on the floor. Was. When we found it, all the broken pieces were piled together. As neat as you please. Smack in the middle of the table. <laughs> 